remember the way he looked at me. Like you're looking at me right now, but strangely different. And when we were examining him with the coma recovery scale, which is a scale we use in people who had a coma, and what we're trying to find out whether there is any recovery of consciousness, would, for example, move a mirror in front of his eyes, but he would never follow. And the physicians who sent him to us initially thought he was in a persistent vegetative state. I don't like that term. I don't think we can compare humans with vegetables, plants. So as chairman of the European task force, well, we've proposed to refer to them as being in an unresponsive wakefulness, because that's what we see there after their coma, awakening, meaning they open their eyes, but they're unresponsive. They will never respond to a simple question. They will show no oriented responses. And even if with the team at the University Hospital in Liège, we've seen many hundreds of people like him, it's still for some of them a real challenge. And, and I remember wondering, is there anybody in there? And the story I would like to share today with you is the one of a man named Loris. And he agreed that I would tell you his story, and so did his parents who actually um, encouraged me to, to tell what happened. He was at a party with his girlfriend and two of his friends, and they had quite a lot of drinks and wanted to drive back home. But their car hit a truck, and they all died. Except for Loris, who survived the spirit and intensive care, where initially he was breathing through a machine, and then he started to breathe on his own, and he opened his eyes, and he was one of these patients who were sent to us in Liège, from all over Europe, actually, basically for two questions, and that is, is there any consciousness? And the second question, is there anything we can do to help them? So let me share here with you the brain scans. So what we see here is an MRI looking into his brain. And you see a normal brain with all these billions of neurons taking a lot of space. And in his case, there is an atrophy. The brain really is much smaller. And it's this black, this is fluid, taking the place of what should be brain. And that is caused by that dramatic car accident. But now let's look inside and look at the connections in this brain. And again, you see, in a normal brain, it's, it's like a tree with all these branches, these connections we call axons, and you see basically the fragility. And in his brain, it's very clear that there is way less of these branches. This is what we call diffuse axonal injury. It's, it's all over the brain. And, and this shock basically broke these brain connections and was the reason for him to be comatose. But we still wonder, okay, there's a lot of damage here, but would there still be a functioning brain somehow, a functioning mind? And that's why we do another test, which is called PET-CT, where we basically inject radioactive sugar. And your brain is using a lot of energy, and we can see it here. You see the yellow, it's, it's these neurons using the sugar, and in his case, well, we see that there are some parts, some islands in his gray matter also being active. So there seems to be a functioning brain, a functioning mind. And we can also try to access that by using what is called a brain-computer interface. So here we look at the electrical activity of his brain. Let's just look at the front there in red. And you see that when we're presenting him with different sounds, his brain will react differently. That's that green part. So yes, we've answered the first question. 
He is somehow in there, perceiving, seeing, feeling, even if he can't communicate it. This is what we call a minimally conscious state. And I think it's very important to try and answer that first question, whether or not these patients are conscious. Because, of course, many things change. Because now we know Loris can perceive emotions, but also pain. So we should be very careful. We should give him painkillers. Make sure he's comfortable. What I wanted to say is that here we answer the first question, and that's, is he somehow conscious? And yes, he is. It's a condition we now call minimally conscious, and I think it's very important, because many things change. Already, we now know that Loris can perceive emotions, but also pain, so we'll make sure he's comfortable, receive painkillers. But we also want to make sure he gets proper rehab. We want to stimulate his damaged brain. And that can be a challenge. He came from France, and there, some parts of the country, it's very difficult, actually, to get access to these rehab centers. When I saw him, he was 27. And in the Netherlands, that's too old to get access to rehab after traumatic brain injury. And I think that is outrageous. We should change that. Now, everything I've been telling you so far is like clinical routine for us, all the brain scans. And now I would like to share with you what might be a potentially new treatment for these people with severe traumatic brain injury. And that is called transcranial direct current simulation, where basically we're trying, transcranial means it goes through the skull and a direct current will be applied for 20 minutes every day. You see the electrodes and we're trying to increase the brain function of these parts here in yellow. You see the electrical fields. And of course, this, this is a new therapy. So, so we take this through the ethics committee and we need the patients to give their informed consent, but they can't because they can't communicate. So it's the family who write down, they agree to participate in this scientific experiment. Where if you want to find out that a specific drug, or in this case the electrical stimulation, really helps, you need to perform what is called a placebo-controlled randomized double-blind study. Whoa. That means placebo-controlled. You're going to compare your treatment, often it would be a drug, with a placebo, a sugar pill. In our case, it's the electrical stimulation with some fake stimulation. Just put the electrodes and the machine pretends it's doing something. You'll do it randomized, which means you will just flip a coin. That coin decides whether the patient at this moment receives the real or the fake stimulation. And then it's double-blind. That means the patient, the family, but also the clinician, they don't know whether it's the real or the fake. Because you really want to make sure that if you see some change, some improvement, that it's really caused by your treatment. So Loris enrolled in this clinical trial, put on the machine, stimulate him, and using this coma recovery scale, then we see now he's answering to simple questions. In his case, it was move your leg. And then he starts to vocalize. Do this for every day, one week, then we stop, take the other machine. We don't know which is the real or the fake one, but the second time, basically, there was no change. And of course, in medicine, we don't like anecdotal evidence, so we're going to do this in many patients. We now have over 100 that benefited from this technique. And what I show you here is, is the result from, from that group, and this has been published. And in black, you see the, the, the scores going up. The patient is getting, getting better. And in gray, you see the fake stimulation, basically. It's, it's not changing. So we here think we could have something that could help patients with severe brain injury to get better. And then, one could ask the question, well, all right, but why should we care? And Loris 
Sure, he's still dependent on others to eat, get dressed. And we need to accept that everyone is different there and, and we all have our values and some people might prefer not to live in certain conditions. And I think also as a medical doctor we should um, take care of, of those very difficult end-of-life decisions. But here for Loris, what to me was maybe the most important is when his father asks him, are you happy? And he gives a huge smile and he signs yes. So I think we should care. And in Europe, every day, there's 200 people dying from traumatic brain injury, mostly young adults. And there's even more who survive their coma and remain severely disabled for the rest of their lives, like Loris. And I think as a society, but also my medical community, we've been ignoring this silent epidemic. And so when some, including my own colleagues, would say, I think, you know, it's just a waste of time and money what you're trying to do there. I would strongly disagree. And traumatic brain injury can strike anyone, anytime. I think we should care about persons like Loris, and there's hundreds of him. And we should improve their care pathway and not ignore these patients with severe traumatic brain injury. And is it worth it? Well, I think his story and his smile definitely, for me, tells me it is. So I want to thank him, his parents, our team in Liège, and all those who do care. Thank you. Thank you.